how would you describe the state of Oregon streets right now? Yeah, we have a crisis in our streets that is driven by our homeless issues. Of course, Oregonians are feeling it. Um, and as I've traveled the whole state, there's no doubt that it is statewide. That is the truth and the reality of homelessness for Oregon right now, is it does, does touch on every corner of our state. But it's especially shocking to experience in Portland and in Metro. And you know whether or not somebody's in my neck of the woods, kind of the Oregon City area, at some point, you know, uh, sleeping on a walkway, or whether or not they are in sort of Gresham or Portland, uh, homeless challenges across our state have created a completely different experience for what for what it feels like to be out in our communities right now. Hmm. So, how do you plan to address this crisis? A lot of times, it's a municipal issue. How will you make a difference at the state level? Yeah, I have committed to declare a homelessness state of emergency, and handing this out down to municipalities. I don't think is the best approach for full responsibility. If you think about it, homeless populations, by the nature of being unhoused, they really do move between jurisdictions. And so expecting one small community, like take Grants Pass, for example, uh, to be able to sustain on their very tight budgets down there in that more low income part of the state, mm -hmm. how are they gonna be able to sustain and support the kind of infrastructure necessary for homeless response like you might be able to achieve in Portland or an urban core? Um, it's, it's really going to leave some communities unable to fully accu and accurately respond to their homeless crisis alone. The homelessness state of emergency is intended to marshal resources at all levels and come alongside local jurisdictions and municipalities and ensure that their response to homelessness is supported by state support financially as well as guidance, technical assistance. Uh, there's a lot of complexity right now responding to court decisions in particular. And, um, and the need for the state to engage in this at a statewide level, I think, is, is an absolute must. What tools will you use specifically that, say, we aren't using already? You know, uh, the opportunity to provide a legal basis for communities moving forward with their response to homelessness, I think, is very, very important. I think a lot of communities, if you talk to local mayors, county commissioners, they feel like their hands are tied today. They say, I don't, I, you know, we can't do it. We just can't do it. We don't have the beds. And, and the state's response can, in fact, provide clarity on those issues and, and help them better understand what options are available to them. But more than, but more than anything else, legalizing Measure 110 was a mistake for Oregonians from my perspective now that we've seen it on the ground. And being, uh, being engaged in the process to repeal that helps with the populations that, uh, that are actively seeking kind of an addiction or drug-related uh, lifestyle here in the state of Oregon and allows for us to have more resources, more public safety engagement, uh, more use of our diversion courts, frankly, and helping people get into the help that they need. But it will be support for shelter space. It will be ad additional investments. Mm -hmm. And it will be support for the workforce that will back up the mental and behavioral health needs that we have as a state. And where will that money come from? You will see um, from in my, in my first budget a prioritization of that with dollars that are otherwise being uh, directed right now to, to programs that, that are not as essential and critical. So we're talking general fund support. And, and I actually believe that too much of our, of our dollars that are uh, the taxes that we receive from beer and wine and all those kinds of things are going to support general fund. I think all of those taxes should go to support mental and behavioral health supports. How will you not only address this crisis, but also the symptoms of this crisis, like addiction, trash, crime? Yeah, um, a lot of those challenges are, are in fact in the hands of local communities to ensure that their local police force is fully funded. I will support uh, fully funding police at all levels of government and providing additional supports to local governments who don't have the tax base to be able to achieve that. You know, I get this question a lot related to, ta related to Portland mm -hmm. because they made the decision to reduce funding for their law enforcement. And they've since experienced the effects of that uh, with increased crime, increased homicides, a lack of a police presence has harmed everybody within that region, that service region. And their police are really stretched thin. So we need you know, our metro area to reprioritize law enforcement within their own budgets. But certainly at the state level, I will do that. On your campaign website, you say that you're aiming to make homelessness rare and temporary, while some of your competitors are aiming to get rid of it altogether. Why is it that homelessness won't be going away under your leadership? Yeah, the, 
the approach to homelessness, I think, needs to be an approach that's long-term. There are no magic bullets to, in some cases, the human condition. And we have programming right now within the metro area that local jurisdictions have adopted that I'm really strongly supportive of. And, and that program right now is called Built for Zero. And the concept behind this, it really is that they are able to have better understand who's on their streets and better understand what services and supports they need to transition from being houseless to being fully stabilized and able to you know, contribute to their own lives and their best future again. And, and, that, and that approach is one that doesn't view it as a faceless, nameless, 14,000 point in time count but instead looks at it more of a case management approach that says, you know, this person is in the it ha is, is houseless, this is what's been made available to them, this is where they are in that sort of progression from houselessness to stability. And we have to look at it like as people, as people come into this situation and, you know, different circumstances in people's lives create the moment where they become homeless. Mm -hmm. And we need to look at it as a functional zero and that functional zero says that this is a problem that we can tackle on a case-by-case -case basis and maintain supports for people and not let it get out of control like it has right now. So I want to talk about Measure 110 a little bit more. R repealing that, how, what effect will that have on our police force mm -hmm. and our jails that are already short-staffed? Yeah, no, it's critically important because right now we have crime that's just out of control um, from the populations that are, in fact, you know, experiencing addiction, and throughout the and throughout that experience, you know, for them to be able to feed that addiction as they face substance use disorder, which is another term uh, that references that that challenge, they end up engaging in property crimes, which is pressure, which is additional pressure on our criminal justice system. So one way or another, we need police engagement on this on this issue. They happen to be prepared for the challenge. They happen to be people that are in the communities and they know the populations that are that are houseless in their communities. They engage with them and and in fact getting folks who are facing uh, addiction and substance use disorder challenges into treatment courts uh, is going to be critically important to giving them one opportunity after another to choose recovery, to choose long-term stability. And just turning a blind eye and accepting um, you know uh, public use of hard drugs is not okay. It's not okay for our communities. It's not okay for the people that are experiencing addiction. We need to give them every single opportunity we possibly can to get themselves into treatment. It's, it's called addiction for a reason. You know, that's why we've seen in Measure 110 people haven't voluntarily, uh, you know, called the number and gotten themselves help. It's, it's tough. It's a battle. And for them to get help to, to be able to overcome those challenges, sometimes you need a consequence associated with that behavior. Uh, and our diversion courts and treatment courts are the way to get there. And so there is a lack of addiction treatment facilities in, say, in Portland. Yeah. What will you do to increase those facilities and those services? You know, right now we have um, the ability to, to work alongside our nonprofit partners and others to ensure that they have the support that they need to continue to expand services. There's, there, depending on where you're at in the continuum of care and the needs that you have, um, there's certainly a lack of beds on the most, uh, the most sort of extreme side of things, and there's active work going on to increase bed capacity in the in in that part in that part of the service sector. Uh, but when it comes to addiction treatments and supports, we have access not just in Portland but across the entire state. So in my particular legislative district, uh, I represent a kind of rural Clackamas County, and we happen to have adult and teen challenge out all the way out in Estacada. And there's bed space and it's residential care, and they would often go with beds open. And, and so what we have right now is a need to better understand the entire system and what's available system-wide, and not just look at it like I said, mentioned from the beginning. I think if we get too focused on the individual jurisdiction, that, it's getting, that that is where the pressure points are right now, but we need to see it as a statewide system and continuum of care, and use all the resources that are available right now to get people help. And so what specifically will you do at the, at the statewide level to increase these services? We have got to better understand what's available right now, uh, where our opportunities are to get people into treatment immediately, and then make the decision for, okay, what services are lacking, what else do we need to expand, where do we need to expand it? I think right now there is not a full and complete uh, inventory and understanding of what's available fully statewide. I certainly think we know in Portland, but as we know throughout the course of the pandemic, if you just look at response, say, to our shelter bed space, mm -hmm. we found that 
that oftentimes our shelter space was not at, at maximum capacity. People were declining the opportunity to get into shelter. And in some cases in our state, the, true, the same is true for addiction services. And so we need to be able to look at this statewide, do the inventory, better understand what the needs are, better understand, frankly, who is this population and what needs are they, are they facing. You know, I, the statistics are that about 80% of our, of our homeless populations are facing some version of addiction. They're, they are having substance use challenges, 80%. Now, who are they? What part of the state are they in? What needs do they have? We need to start to really, at a state level, take the information that is kind of all across all of our nonprofits and all across all of our service sectors and begin, and begin to collaborate at a level that we haven't yet done. And the emergency declaration on homelessness allows us to do that, frankly forces us to do that. Mm -hmm. There has been no one requiring that level of collaboration across, across the entire continuum of care, and I will do that. And you also speak of building more affordable housing units, but that's a very lengthy process, and we yeah. need immediate action right now. So to be clear on the affordable housing side of things, there's a huge difference between state-funded, state-mandated uh, affordable housing units. Uh, you know, we've spent nearly $2 billion all in on housing in the last year and a half in the state of Oregon. Whether or not, you know, that is support for renters and landlords or whether or not that's building tiny homes and, and increasing access to, to affordable homes. What I'm talking about when I talk about affordable housing, when I talk to builders, when I talk to the people who are on the private sector side, they are saying, I can build houses, I can build apartments. I need local governments to work with me. I need to be able to move through the regulatory process in something short of two years. So I was talking to a particular um, uh, housing provider, and as a builder, he said, I've got 2,000 apartments coming online. I could do more if I could get through the process faster. That's really what we need on the private sector side of things. We've done an awful lot on the public sector side. It's time to recognize that, that there are people that want to meet that need on the private sector side, and we need to reduce regulations, and we need to make this process easier for them to move through. The priority has to be housing, but it doesn't have to be the government's response to housing. It can, in fact, be the private sector side response to housing, but we need to make sure that that process is one that's fast and simple and that they can move through it quickly enough and get housing back online. And what's your specific plan to, to do that? Can we make this the last question? Yeah, of course, thank you. So when it, co when it comes to affordable housing, you know, when you, talk, when you talk to builders, it really is permitting for them. It's, it's the time that it takes to get from point A to point B on the permitting process. Mm -hmm. And some of, that has to, some of that has to do with the responsiveness of local jurisdictions, and in some cases, it's the state. And so, you know, in my first 100 days of office, I've committed to reviewing rules and regulations across the board and, re and revising, repealing, or rolling back the ones that are an impediment and a barrier. And, and that begins, of course, with housing as well. And I just have one quick final one. If, if homelessness is someone's primary issue, primary concern going into this election, why should they vote for you? You know, I am the only candidate in this race that, that has not been a part of the problem for the last 10, 20 years that got us here. In particular, Tina Kotek passed legislation that created our experience of homelessness in Oregon by advancing this concept that people, in fact, should live in tent encampments on our streets. That is wholly unacceptable to the people that are in that condition and certainly to the communities that are impacted by it. We have got to go in a new direction for our state. And in order to do that, we cannot take the same people that have gotten us into this situation and entrust them to fix it. They won't. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you Welcome as well. Welcome to Oregon. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs>